If you brought your Bibles with you today, or perhaps you want to turn on uh, your phones or your tablets to our scripture text, uh, it's found in Luke chapter 8. And so I invite you to turn there as I read a portion to you. Luke chapter 8. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 40. Luke chapter 8, beginning to read at verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman who was there, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her, she came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. And immediately, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. And then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's mother and father. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. And then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. This morning's message is entitled, It's a Miracle. And uh, you can uh, see on your screen that there's a, a picture of John Boy. Do you remember him from the Waltons? John Boy uh, starred in another documentary that ran for four seasons. Uh, if you have a subscription to Apple TV, you can find this series there. And he went from site to site investigating whether the miracles that were reported were really true. And as I said, the show lasted for some time because uh, people uh, wanted to see this too. Because on one hand, we have skeptics who would say that the miraculous is impossible. It just amounts to people believing in something and believing so hard um, that they make this appear as if it was really true. And then on the other hand, you have people who say, yes, miracles can still happen today. There was a song from 1975, we'll have to reach back for that one, uh, entitled, I Believe in Miracles, and it was written by Hot Chocolate. Those of you who know the song know why I didn't put the lyrics up on the screen behind me this morning. 
I believe in miracles. Do you? I believe in miracles. Why do I believe in miracles? One of the reasons why I believe in miracles is because of logic. It just makes sense that if you believe in a God who created the rules of nature and is greater than all of those rules himself, meaning that he is transcendent and apart from all that he created, if you believe that he created everything out of nothing, then logic dictates that you have to believe that he can go beyond the natural order that he created. That supernatural things can happen at his hand. That he is the one who has the power to do that. And so I believe in miracles because of logic. I also believe in miracles because they are accounted in the scriptures. And we can believe the Bible not only contains the word of God, but is the actual word of God. We know through textual studies that the gospel accounts were written early enough that they can be verified as actually happening. And what I mean by that is that when they were written, there were still people alive that were eyewitnesses to the things that were in the Gospels. And if these stories had have been invented or exaggerated, there would have been people right away who said, that's not true. The manuscripts wouldn't have been copied and copied and copied and given to other people. So I believe that the Bible is authoritative. And as we just learned in our study on archaeology, that we continue through archaeological digs to find artifacts that verify and back up the stories that are included in the Scriptures. And finally, I believe that the Bible is true and can be believed because it stood the test of time. People's lives continue to be changed by its message today as they were when Jesus walked on this planet. As they were in the Old Testament when the people followed God. The Bible is believable. And the Bible says that there were miracles so miracles happen, I believe. I guess I should go on and say that there is, um, maybe I could word it as a negative reason why I don't believe it. I have never seen it, but I've read about a Bible called the Jefferson Bible. And as the story goes, Thomas Jefferson took the Gospels and he cut out all of the references to a miracle that were in the Gospels. And all that you were left with was Jesus' moral teaching. And people look at the Jefferson Bible and they say that Jesus really was nothing more than Gandhi, a moral person and an ethical teacher. I believe in miracles because Jesus is the Son of God who left the throne room of heaven and was incarnated or came in flesh as we celebrate every year at Christmas time. I believe in miracles. But for miracles to make an impression upon you, you have to ask yourself the question why do we have them? What's the purpose of miracles? Well, as we see the miracles in the New Testament, we can see that Jesus was moved with compassion, and he healed people. 
we can see the compassion of our Lord and Savior lived out with the crowds in which he traveled to. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why we see miracles in the Bible. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why God can continue to do miracles today. I guess I should elaborate on that point because if we believe that God is eternal and the same yesterday, today, and forever, we need to believe that if he was able to do miracles in the first century when Jesus walked on the earth, that he is still able to do miracles today. Miracles had a purpose. And it wasn't just Jesus' compassion. It was also so that people could visibly see the power of God over sin displayed. Jesus' miracles were more than a magic trick. Jesus' miracles were more than a a sleight of hand. Jesus' miracles were done for a purpose. They illustrated that with the Messiah that there was a new world order coming. And that that world order had begun right with Jesus' public ministry. That things were beginning to change. That the kingdom of God was here. And that kingdom of God continues to be lived out and will one day be made complete. Completely fulfilled when Jesus comes back and sin is eradicated and its effects upon society and its evil will all be done away with. Jesus' miracles were visible illustrations that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. And in this chapter, I skip to the end of Luke 8. But if you read earlier in the book, you would see that it contains not one, but four different miracles. And in the the sovereignty of God, illustrating God's control, he shows just how powerful he is. So let's quickly review the four miracles that Luke includes in chapter 8. First of all, Jesus and his disciples are on one side of the the Sea of Galilee and they want to to travel over to the other side. And so they got in a boat and they went across. Storms in that part of the world because the Sea of Galilee was low and surrounded by mountains that storms could come over the mountains quickly. Quickly. And quite often, fishermen will be caught out at sea in the middle of a storm. When I had the opportunity to go to a holy land, I went out in a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Fortunately, none of those storms came up at that time. But there was another day when we were there, and we stopped the bus at a restaurant at dinner time. And I could see over the hills a black cloud forming. And it came so quick that before we got out of the bus and walked into the restaurant, it was already in the midst of a downpour. It came that fast. And it poured and the wind blew. And then by the time we finished our meal, the storm was past. And we walked to the the, uh, bus in very humid weather with uh, damp pavement and, and uh, actually a mist coming off of it. And so as I read this account of how a storm could come out of nowhere, it's believable for me for what I saw. And so you know the story well. The disciples are afraid and they cry out to Jesus. And what does he do? He calms the storm. He calms the storm. Jesus' followers witnessed a miracle firsthand. Picture in your mind great big rolling waves. Picture in your mind wind strong enough to change the course of a boat. And then picture in your mind a slick calm 
where the water is like glass that you can almost see through. That took a miracle. And in so doing, Jesus proved that God had power over nature. Power over nature. This wasn't new to the Israelites. They had read the stories of the Old Testament, the crossing of the Red Sea. They had seen that, but now the disciples, with their own eyes in their own lifetime, had seen a miracle and had seen the power of God so obviously on display. You can picture them with knees and knocking, full of fear, because they realized what a powerful presence they were in the midst of. Next, the next miracle, the second miracle, is probably one that um, doesn't resonate with us as well because it involved uh, an exorcism. And I don't know about you, but um, I was a teenager when the, the exorcist came out in the movie theaters. And I had the opportunity to go on a date with one of the most popular girls in my high school, and that's where she wanted to go. And so we went to watch The Exorcist, and uh, I was absolutely terrified, but I had to pretend that I was real macho to be around her. And, uh, you know, are you okay? Do you want to stay to the end of the movie? We in, in the Baptist church don't talk a whole lot about the demonic. We don't talk a, a whole lot um, about people being possessed. Um, we kind of think that Maybe that was something that occurred in the biblical era, but um, we don't see it in our lifetime, and so it's difficult for it to resonate with us. I want to go on, and I want to say this, that just because we have never seen a miracle does not mean that miracles do not happen And just because we have never seen demon possession doesn't mean that it doesn't still happen today. In Jesus' day and age, they found this this man, and and he, he didn't just have one demon in him. He had a legion of demons. Now, a legion was a a term that was used um, for the Romans. A a legion uh, was a section of their army, a section of their guards. Um, And it employed, I think it was 75 uh, members that were in it. And so the idea that Luke is trying to get at is that it wasn't just one demon. It was many, many And Jesus showed that he, the Son of God, had power over evil. And you know the story. He cast the the demons out of the people and into the pigs, and they went over the cliff to their demise. What that story tells us is that Jesus has power over evil. And what I want to point out to you is that there is plenty of evil in our contemporary society. And where we see those pockets of evil, where we see difficulty and turmoil and violence, We have to understand that the only long-term cure to all that ills the world is Jesus. And that at any point in time, he could miraculously transform someone's life like he did to this man in the first century. People caught in the throes of alcoholism. People caught in the throes of drug addiction. God is able to reach down and touch them and change their lives. In the course of my ministry, when it it has come to alcoholism, I have seen that. I remember one man in particular. 
who his testimony, I heard him give it. He told me that he was drunk every day from the time he was a teenager uh, until he gave his life to Jesus. Every day. He went to work drunk. He drove his vehicle drunk. Um, all of his activities. He got up in the morning, and the first thing that he did is you drink a glass of orange juice. He took a drink of alcohol. And through a, a strange series of events, his pastor invited him to go to a men's breakfast at a camp. And he thought, I can't go if I'm drinking, and I can't go with the pastor if I'm smoking. And he said for the first time in his life, he had a hangover as he went with his pastor. And he so craved a cigarette that he couldn't have. And you know, way back at that camp, that man gave his life to Jesus. And the minute that he gave his life to Jesus, miraculously, his craving for alcohol was taken from him. It was a miracle. Now that doesn't happen to, to everyone that's caught up in the throes of, of alcohol and drug addiction, but for this man, that is how God dealt with his life. His life was transformed, and he went down to Mexico to become a missionary. A miracle of God triumphing over evil. And God still does that in our day and age. That's when we see the power of God. The story goes on. And God shows that he has power over illness. Power over illness. Now, I don't know if everyone in the room truly believes that God can miraculously heal people, but we have a list of people that we pray for in our church in our prayer time on Thursday nights, and we pray that they would be healed. And so I think that the closest that we come to believing in miracles comes in our prayer life for the sick. When we pray that God would heal. Well, in this story in the first century, the third miracle is that of a woman. She had a very embarrassing, bleeding condition for 12 years, meaning that she wasn't allowed to go out in the public because of her uncleanness. And in this instance, she has heard about Jesus, the Messiah, and the miracles and she gets caught up in the crowd, and you can see that there was a mob mentality because the crowd kept pushing closer and closer and closer to Jesus. And this woman got pushed so close that no one noticed her uncleanness, and she rubbed up against Jesus. And her bleeding stopped. Her condition was miraculously cured. She would not be embarrassed to be in public anymore. Twelve years. The emphasis on the, the twelve is that Jesus' power could change a physical condition that was even, that a person even had over a long period of time. So I want you to think of a person with a deformity that they were born with, and the power of God is strong enough to cure that miraculously. That's what this story illustrates for us. Jesus, he, he says that he feels the power went out of him, and he asked his disciples, who touched me? And his disciples are, are like, Jesus, everybody's touching you. The crowd's all pushing against. And the woman, she steps forward, and she says, it was me. She had been healed. Her faith, if she could just get close enough to touch Jesus, made her whole. So we see through miracles the power of God displayed over nature, the power of God displayed over evil, and the power of God displayed over sickness. And the fourth area that we see is the power of God was dis displayed with victory over death. Victory over death. There was a leader in a synagogue. His name was Jairus. 
He had one child, one and only, a 12-year-old girl that he was so proud of. The focus on the text shows us of the immensity of the loss that he would have if she was gone. And so this Jew, this Jewish leader, he goes to Jesus and he falls before him in a position of humility and he says, my daughter is deathly sick. Will you come and heal her? Jesus agrees to, but, but on the way, he meets the woman that I just talked about, and he's delayed. So long that a group of people come from this girl's house, and they inform him that the girl has already passed away. Jesus is undaunted, and he continues his journey, and he goes there, so much so that when he got there, the people laughed at him. Laughed at him. What are you going to do? You missed the boat. You didn't get here in time, and, and now she's dead. And Jesus says to them, she's not dead. She's sleeping. She's sleeping. Now, don't miss the point in that. Jesus is not saying that she wasn't risen from the dead. By using the term sleeping, he was simply saying that her position is temporary. She will be raised again. It truly was a miracle. Some people read that story and they, they think that she was unconscious and Jesus just went over and, and gave her a good shake and, and brought her back to. No, no, that's not the point of the text. The point of the text is that the people were mourning and crying because she was dead. She stopped breathing. There was no brain activity. Her heart was no longer beating. She had already begun to turn gray in color. And Jesus came and saw her. Jesus came and saw her. And you can picture him with compassion, tenderly grabbing that little girl's hand and raising her up from the dead, proving that he had power over death. Perhaps even foreshadowing the fact that he one day would die and would be raised from the dead by the power of God. The little girl was hungry, the text says, and he commands the parents to go and feed her. It's a miracle. I believe in miracles because miracles display the power of God. And they do so today in our lives. Now you say, I have never, ever seen a miracle. I want to respond by saying, yet. Yet. Don't give up. You may have the opportunity in your lifetime to see a miracle. Miracles by the very fact that they are, are supernatural means that they don't happen all the time. They are the odd occurrence, the odd event, event, but they continue to happen. It pains me to use this next illustration, and you'll know why in a minute. Perhaps Montreal Canadiens' most famous hockey player was Morris the Rocket Richard. The Rocket, in February the 15th, scored his 49th goal. And the crowd went crazy. But they wondered, will the Rocket score 50 goals? Will he get 50 goals in this season? Well, you know the end of the story. He got 50 goals in 50 games and was the first player to accomplish that. Why that pains me is you'll never guess what team he was playing against when he scored that 50th goal. My beloved Boston Bruins. You, but the part of the story that you might not know is that there was a month in between when he scored his 49th goal 
and he scored his 50th goal. And the crowds poured into the form in Montreal in game after game and in visiting arenas game after game. Will this be the day that we see the 50th goal scored? And there was a frenzy that was growing as they waited and as they waited. Why do I use that as an illustration? Because that explains what our mentality needs to be We haven't seen a miracle, but tomorrow could be the day that we do. And our next worship service could be the time that we do. The next time that we pray with the sick could be the time that Jesus grants a miracle. It could be after the next period of fasting that we go through that God grants the healing that we've been praying for. We need to live with that sense of expectancy. What happens, because we're mere mortals, we're humans, is the same thing happens with our thoughts about the second coming. From the time Jesus left the earth, he said that he would come back, and people have been waiting and waiting and waiting, and 2,000 years have gone by, and we're still waiting, and we look at a world ravaged by COVID, and we think, when is Jesus coming? And we begin to lose that sense of expectancy. Well, he didn't come for the last 2,000 years. He's probably not going to come for the next 2,000. I haven't seen a miracle in my lifetime so far, so I'm probably not going to see a miracle. I challenge you today to take the billows to the embers of your faith, to your belief in miracles. And cause those billows billows to put air on the embers of your faith so that it burns spectacularly again. So that each day when you wake up, you do so with expectancy. This could be the day that I see the miraculous. Let me close with just saying this. We've looked at four miracles today. There's a fifth one that we see in our church and in our church family. And of all the miracles that we've looked at thus far, I believe that this is the greatest miracle of all. And that is the miracle of the new birth. It happens every time when God's Spirit touches an individual in a unique way and that makes truths that one time seemed unbelievable, believable. It makes proud people humble as they confess their sin, promise God to repent of it, ask Jesus to forgive them for their wrong, and promise to live for Him the rest of their life. And what we see visibly before our eyes is God's Spirit at work changing people's lives. People who were affected and even hardened by sin are transformed. Hearts that were once hard are softened and people begin to reflect Christ's likeness. Instead of pursuing their own ambitions now, they pursue the advancement of the kingdom of God. Instead of living for themselves, they're ready to live their life making sacrifices for the benefit of God. Whenever we see that happen, whenever we dip someone beneath the water of baptism and bring them out a new person, we symbolically say, I saw a miracle. If you have believed in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've seen a miracle. And if you never believed, today could be the day that you see the miracle of a new birth, a changed lives. If you would like to see that miracle in your life, I invite each of you to pray. I invite each of you to confess your sin, to repent of it, and to embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Let's bow. Father God in heaven, we believe in miracles. 
And we believe that the greatest miracle that you're able to perform is the miracle of the new birth. We desire to see your power displayed in changed lives. Father, today, we confess and repent of our sin and ask that you would fill us anew with your spirit. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.